We'll start this way, and we'll go around, and we'll uh, talk a little bit. How did you decide to pursue the career that you're working on today? We'll start with you, Dr. Hassan. I hope this is on, yes. <laughs> so how did I decide? Well, I decided at a very young age, possibly around five or seven, that I wanted to be a physician. And the reason was very different what I look back at. It was because my aunt was a gynecologist, and when she would v visit us, she was a major in the army, and I would like her, to, when she comes out of the car, the driver opens the door, <laughs> she gets out with her, all her uniform and the stars, and he salutes her. I said, this is what I want to do, you know? <laughs> But I never joined the army, so here I am a physician because of that reason. <laughs> Senator Hassel Thompson, same question for you. Well, how did you decide to pursue the career that you're in, public service? Which one? <laughs> so, so she has so many. We'll go with public service. I think it chooses you. I think it's part of an evolution of your own growth and so that you grow into issues, you grow into situations. So I think that was more happenstance than plan. Laura? Uh, sure, I actually worked in corporate America for a while and um, I'm a corporate dropout and proud of that. And I've, I've found many fellow travelers in the nonprofit world now who are also corporate dropouts. Um, I found myself doing a lot of volunteer work because my job was not very um, fulfilling. And at some point I said, well, you know what, why don't I do this volunteer work as my work? So that was a great idea. I took a pay cut of about half and I got a really crappy office <laughs> instead of a nice one with a window. But I certainly have not looked back. I've had the uh, real privilege of working with some really wonderful organizations and supporting their mission. Sure. So, um, you know, I always, I often say that entrepreneurship really isn't a choice. It's either in you or it's not, um, similar to what you were saying as well. And so um, I actually went to Boston University's College of Communication, majored in public relations, had 13 different internships by the time I graduated, and I started my company, Ruby Media Group, as soon as I graduated. So I sort of threw myself into it. I had $500 in my bank account at the time, and I said, I'm gonna do this. And I used my experience for my internships. I actually never uh, worked in corporate because I just said, I'm, I'm gonna sort of hang out a shingle and do this on my own. So um, I've been doing it for over 12 years now, but there's this notion that, um, you know, there's a book called Never Get a Real Job, and I'm a firm believer in that, that if you, <laughs> you don't have to, you know, there's another way. You can pave your own way um, if you want to and work hard enough. Hi. Um, I am actually going through a career, yeah, I did a career change, and um, I left the film and TV business. Um, I guess I'm also a corporate dropout. Um, it, there was a, I guess, I see it as an opportunity. There was a corporate restructure, we all know what that means, and um, it was coincidental timing that it was, um, you know, a momentous year of activism where a lot of women across the country were getting um, active in civic and community and political activism, and I was in the midst of that. So, um, you know, after you come out of a layoff and you realize you're, you know, you have a cause that you want to throw yourself at, um, you know, I know what I, I did what I did best, which was, um, you know, the, the job hustle and um, seeing that there was an opportune, ripe time for me to uh, parlay into uh, work and field where I can really, you, you know, explore and use my full passion. I've always liked my work, but I think in the uh, prior time, I wasn't sure I liked my job. And that's, I think work and job is different. And so this was my opportunity to, you know, uh, really continue the work I love, but also create a job I really love. So that's where I am. It's always a hustle being on your own. Um, but I, I do that best and I'm surrounded by people who are, it, the timing is right. So I felt like this was kismet and organic. So that's where I am. I think a lot of women sometimes find it difficult to find that work-life balance. 
Could you shed some light and we'll ask the rest of the panel as well. I, I think that gets tossed around a lot, that phrase work-life balance. I mean, let's face it, so much of our life is work. You know, you're always at work, you're working at home. So for me, it was about, I'm tired of trying to juggle and balance and find that line. It was like, if I'm going to be work doing, being so involved and knee deep in work, I want it to matter and I want it to also align with my personal values and um, the work that I'm doing at home that my child will see, that it could be uh, something that we can speak to and not have to put away or do it in the closet when he's asleep or you know, sneaking off to do a text or message, which you know, we, we do all the time. So um, I think work-life balance is really about how you wanna infuse your time when you're with family, with friends, and if you wanna talk a lot of the times you might be with friends or family and you don't want to talk about work or you're like, oh, let's talk about something else. And for me personally, I didn't want that to take up so much space because it could, for me at least, it was negative. So um, again, climate and timing were right, you know, where we are in the country, where we are with uh, empowering one another. Um, and so for me, work-life balance is really about um, how you want to manage your personal life, you know, where no matter if you're working or not. Anyone else? Yeah, Chris? so, um, you know, I saw a quote once where it said, build a life that you don't need a vacation from. And so I thought a lot about that, right? We're often thinking uh, how we, our whole lives revolve around, when can I get away? When can I do this? But what if you actually liked what you were doing and you weren't constantly thinking about getting away from it? And so it's an interesting philosophy about how you, you know, approach career. Um, as far as work-life balance, um, I, in the be beginning of my career as an entrepreneur, I had a client one time tell me, if you keep going at this pace, you're going to burn out by the time that you're 30. And I thought, no, he's wrong. You know, he doesn't know what he's talking about. But he was, he was actually correct. And uh, because I burned, the, I, I burned it from the candle from both ends. And so I was going out to networking events like every single night when I first started. And just everything was about my business. And so I definitely do think that, um, you know, I, there was some chronic fatigue syndrome and other things that developed because I just um, maybe also hadn't developed other areas of my life because everything was so focused um, on business. So I'm not necessarily sure that I even believe in the, in the notion of work-life balance because, again, I think if you're doing something that you love, it's, it's all sort of one. It, come, it should come together as one rather than this idea and notion of this separation, which I think doesn't necessarily exist. Um, so I think that if we sort of focus on self-care and maybe taking out one hour of the day where you're really doing something on yourself uh, or for yourself, I think that's a, a good uh, starting point for work-life balance to consider. Okay, well, this is, this is why I'm not an entrepreneur, because <laughs> I like to have time off and, and get away from the work. <laughs> um, <laughs> So, and, and fortunately, I've worked for some organizations that do a great job of providing work-life balance. Um, I always um, am interested to hear when this question is asked only of women, and I would like it to be started that this question gets asked of men, too. Um, you know, I, I mean, I think for everybody, you know, look, we live outside of New York City. A lot of people work in the city. There's this crazy frenetic, you know, you have to do more, you have to work more. And it's just not healthy for people, um, I think. And it's certainly not healthy for me. So I've made some conscious decisions. Have I probably sacrificed um, some of my, you know, earning potential? Yes, I have. But did I get to spend more time with my child? Absolutely. And someday when I'm on my deathbed, I'm going to be happy I spent the time with the child, not that I earned, you know, a couple hundred dollars more. Life balance for me is very different, I think, as I would describe it from the previous speakers. Balance for me was I had two young girls, and having had the career moves that I had made, first in nursing and then in construction and just kind of moving around, it was a big objective for me to spend as much of my time with my children. And I took jobs, and I, I guess I've just been extremely fortunate in that respect, because I took those jobs that allowed me to be a class mother, to be able to go on trips with my children, and to their detriment, they hated it. But, <laughs> 
but it gave me a sense of what their day was like and, and being very involved with them so that the time that I spent away from them working, that it, I could feel very qualitative in that environment and not feel that I had deprived them of anything. One of the things I think that really influenced that thinking for me very early on, I grew up around adults much more than I did other children. I just never enjoyed playing with kids because I thought that the kids were silly <laughs> and it was a lot of nonsense. And so I found, I've always found that being around adult women was a lot more exciting and, and I learned so much. But one of the things that I learned from two of the women who were truly community activists, they were out saving the world. And I looked at their sons, and all four of two, they each had two sons, and each of their sons ended up drug addicted and with some other issues. And so I was really frightened that if, if we didn't spend a certain amount of quality time with our children. Saving the world was not going to matter if we didn't save our families. And so, um, so it caused me to have a, make a very conscious decision that no job, no matter what it paid, was important enough for me not to be there for my children whenever they needed me to be. And just one more quick story. When my, my daughter had her first child, she was living in St. Thomas in the Virgin Islands. And so I went, <laughs> St. Thomians, um, I went to the Virgin Islands for her birthing. She was supposed to deliver on the 15th of September. She didn't deliver till the 19th. But my husband kept calling and saying, you know, when are you coming home? And I said, I'm not. <laughs> um, and the point was, I just felt that the medicine there was primitive, part, sorry. But having worked in New York hospitals, it was very, very different. And I was just afraid for my child. She had to have a C-section, which happened, and, you know, that wasn't planned. And so everything that could go wrong was going wrong. And so I was determined that I was not prepared to, to leave my child. And I stayed with her for 21 days. Yeah. And um, my husband said, did you get fired from your job? <laughs> and I said, no, I have my job. And I am the kind of person they know when I'm working, they get butter from the duck. And that they get more than they pay for. And so if I can't take 21 days to be with my child, it's not important. And I think that that experience also influenced the kind of legislative things that I pursued to make sure that when we talk about family leave and those kinds of things, my experience is a lot of what is in those le legislative initiatives. So when I decided that I wanted to be a physician, um, my father didn't want me to be a doctor. And uh, I asked him, why do you not want me to be a doctor? He says, because I know you enjoy life so much. There's so much in your life. And once you become a physician, life will not be yours. And he was right. So at that time, I decided um, I had a lovely mother who gave 100% of herself to us, five siblings. And, if I said, and I said, if I can't be a mother like her, I don't want, I will not be a mother. Because I didn't want it. Little ones left, and I'm, I have to go because my patient is calling me. So that was a decision I made at that time. And now when I look back, I'm glad I did because I see the tussle which goes on between the people who work for me when the kids are uh, sick and I have to let them go. It is really an issue between single mothers, their children, and how to handle life and work. It's not easy. Mm -hmm. 
I'm just going to toss this next question out to whoever would like to answer, but was there a specific person that impacted your life and helped lead you to the path that you're on today? Does one person do that? I mean, I, I tend to say it was my grandmother. Not that she led me to the path, but she gave me the, the sense of myself that being one of 10 children was very hard for my parents to do. Uh, that's why grandparenting is, to me, one of the most important things next to parenting. Because when grandparents are a part of your life, they can, they sort of augment. They put, you know, mom and dad bring the jelly and the bread, but, you know, they do the marmalade and the special cakes. And, and so, that, that they add spice to your life. But for me, it was a grounding because I never had to question whether she loved me. And so that the advice that she gave me uh, was that which, even when it was difficult, it stayed with me. Uh, I mean, it, it just, it was always there. She said to me, you are not pretty. <laughs> now, she was not being unkind. She was being very real. She said, you're not pretty, and we're not pretty people, but we're beautiful. And your job is to find the beauty in you and in life. And where you find it, that's where you will find your success. And I think that finding the beauty in the people that I've worked with in the substance abuse community for, for many, many years and working with uh, women in prison. I mean, for 16 of my, 14 of my 16 years, I was the uh, ranking member on, just, on the Justice Committee for the Senate. And so I went into every state prison except for three in the state of New York. And I visited women in prison and I talked with women across this state when we did issues around women's issues. I think that the, the conversations that I used to have with my grandmother continued to stay with me because she said that women need women as friends. And they need friends, but they need women as friends because, like it or not, the women are going to tell you the truth but be there to hold you when the truth gets to be too much. Yes. Touching on what Senator Hassel Thompson just said about women need to help each other, for all of you on the panel, maybe we'll start with you, Laura. Is there a special place in hell for women who do not help each other. <laughs> How to start with me? <laughs> I get that question. <laughs> um, you know, that's the, <laughs> it's an interesting way to phrase it. Um, I, I, <laughs> Uh, for, for me, in my experience, um, you know, growing up knowing that I was le a lesbian at a very young age and not having a whole lot of role models and not finding women like myself wherever I was who could be, you know, someone to help me out or give me that leg up, the whatever, you know, all the different metaphors we use. Um, I, you know, I didn't, I never really found the people who were like me to do that for me. And, um, uh, but, I also then came across people who were actually trying to destroy me who and my community and who were hateful and mean. And those are the people who I think, um, unfortunately, may have a special place in hell. Um, <laughs> I, you know, I do, I, I have thought about this quite a lot because as I've gone through my career, you know, I've worked for a lot of women as bosses and, and many of them I've gotten along with just great, you know, and we complement each other's style and those kinds of things. Um, and some of them have been not so helpful, like really, you know, just not bothered to say, you know, I'm a woman, you're a woman, let me help you out here. And I, I really have been disappointed about that through the years. So, you know, I guess I'm not the only one. <laughs> 
Um, so, you know, for me now, being more senior in my career, I'm able to help some of the younger people, and um, that actually gives me a lot of pleasure to be able to do that and um, learn from my millennials in my office <laughs> and um, be able to help them navigate. You know, they, uh, the younger generation coming in to work, especially in the fundraising career and the not-for-profit sector, they have a lot of skills. They know what they're doing because they've done a ton of volunteer work and they've been exposed, but they don't know how to uh, navigate the, the uh, political environment of an office. Office. And, um, you know, having worked in actual politics and even in every office, there is so much that you have to be careful about and think about. And um, that, to me, is a way that I can at least help the next batch coming up. I'd like to add, um, yes, there absolutely is a very special place in hell. <laughs> I also think that special place in hell also is on earth, and I think right now it's on social media. And I think because so many people now in our culture are so fixated on um, you know, the optics of how you live your life and how everything is on public display, I think a public roasting and a takedown of very certain people on social media is a thing now, and I'd like to equate a version of that to people who are on notice publicly blasted, including everybody um, who are complicit in you know, taking down and ruining lives of women and children. So I, I would like to equate that. I, I would love to hear Chris's response for this. She's quite an expert on social media and she has her own group. Yeah, so uh, it's a really interesting uh, topic right now in terms of social media and these public uh, roastings and how people's uh, lives are just entirely ruined by it. Um, I'm, you know, I don't think that's a good thing at all. I think it's a real problem, actually. Um, I think anyone who has a Twitter account or a Facebook account can just create a fake profile and say whatever they want about someone with absolutely no thought at all as to the repercussions of that person's livelihood or their entire career or what could happen as a result of what they're saying or their allegations. So do I think that's great? No, I think people really need to think a lot more before they just put out an opinion and um, basically mistake their opinion as a fact. Because uh, people have families, they have lives, they have careers, and they're just being destroyed, whether, uh, whether you're a man, whether you're a woman, who, regardless of who you are. I think it's a very important thing that we have to think about, which is to just pause before we just click send or we click post. And no one's thinking, you know, they're just posting. And, um, you know, there's also a lot of uh, narcissism, and we talked about optics, right? So social media narcissism, what is that, and how does that impact someone's uh, career? Uh, you know, are you posting things that are more about your own ego than you are about a service mentality of actually helping other people, right? These are things that we actually need to think about. And these are the conversations, I think, for those of us that have uh, families to be talking about with your children, because uh, these are skills. They're actually important skills in the workforce right now. But because social media is still considered such a new phenomenon, it's not necessarily being talked about or taught. So, you know, I think all of that is important. And back to the original question about is there a special place, I guess, in hell for women that don't help other women? So. I may not be the right person to ask this question. My answer would be no. I actually don't think there's a special place in hell because I think that we need to change the conversation. It's not just about a place in hell for women helping other women. It's about people helping other people. And I think the more that we open up that conversation at large, that's what it really should be about. Um, I don't want to think that I'm you know, entitled that I'm going to get favors because uh, I'm a woman and my you know, client is a woman or a boss is a woman, right? I want to think that I'm going to get something because I'm the best for whatever it is. And I think that if we have that mentality, that's what we need to teach people. Not that I deserve something because I am a certain way or look a certain way or because I'm a woman. We've been talking about uplifting and empowering everyone. Dr. Hassan, I want to start with you. What are the keys to developing the next generation of leaders in your industry? Uh, I don't know whether I'll say about my industry, because I think there are quite a few women uh, plastic surgeons out there. I would rather take the conversation to Muslim women and uh, the role I have to play with the negativity which is out there, which started, unfortunately, soon after 
And the impression was that uh, Muslim women are not educated. And because they are not educated, they can't even work. That was the furthermost untruthful statement which the media gave to Americans. The effect it had on Muslim women and Muslims is far outreaching, which anybody can even think of. What has happened in the last couple of years, and I don't want to name anybody. <laughs> It has an effect on our youth. They want to change their names. They don't want to be called Muslims. They don't want to be associated with them. Not all, but many. Girls who took off their hijabs because they didn't want it to be identified as Muslim women. So it's a huge task. So I was doing very well as a plastic surgeon. I didn't have to go do out anything, but that 9-11 changed me, and I felt that they show the world load on my shoulder was that if I'm educated and I can speak the language which is the second ton for me, and I don't go out and meet people in the community and tell them what is the, what is the real faith, what are the teachings, what are the principles, what has made me who I am, then I'm doing disservice to my faith. So yes, that is the role which I have taken up now. And in one of your questions was, what are you most proud of? I think the making of the platform American Muslim Women Association to tell. So people do ask me, why do we put Muslim women in it? Why women? Why not just women? I said, because I wanted to show them that Muslim women can do it.